Hello, and thank you for checking out this talk. My name is Adam Cooper. I'm a PhD student in atmospheric chemistry at the University of California, San Diego. Today, I'll be talking about using non-targeted tandem mass spectrometry to detect molecular markers of microplastics in the coastal environment. And this work is part of a massive collaborative undertaking. And so I'd like to lead with thanking all of my co-authors as well as funding for the research from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and personal support from the NSF GRFP. About 30 miles south of UC San Diego, the Tijuana River crosses the international boundary and with it comes massive amounts of raw sewage and urban and agricultural runoff. This prompted the County of San Diego to declare a public health crisis in the region and the EPA to commit over $600 million to improve wastewater treatment. However, plastic waste management and microplastic removal hasn't reached similar levels of investment. Plastic waste is shredded upstream of border waste divergence and treatment systems, and any refuse which makes it into the Tijuana River Valley is collected downstream in large trash nets where they are left to degrade in wet and dry conditions, and they're only collected once a year. This develops the perfect storm to introduce microplastic pollution into the Tijuana San Diego coastal region. And as others in this session outline, this is not a novel concern. Micro and nanoplastics are completely changing the global environment through the introduction of the plastosphere which is present in almost all environmental systems sampled. I show here a map of microplastic concentrations represented as spikes. These plastics exhibit toxicity by themselves, as well as serving as co-pollutants and vectors for other organics of emerging concern. These include plasticizers like the infamous BPA, as well as stabilizers such as organic UV filters, shown here as circles, and demonstrating the relative lack of information on their environmental concentrations. And so the work presented here will be focusing on these plastic additives as well as other organic pollutants. Additionally, we know the ocean is not static and not just a sink for these pollutants. Crashing waves produce sea spray aerosols, which loft particles into the air where they can impact local air quality through the toxic inhalation burden, as well as undergo global transport. And so to better constrain this environmental challenge of pollutant release from the Tijuana River, subsequent diffusion into the ocean, as well as ocean to air transfer, the 2020 Imperial Beach Tijuana field team conducted an intensive sampling campaign during a two month period in early 2020. And these sampling events were aligned around periods of rainfall shown in blue, which trigger massive spikes in flow of the Tijuana River shown in brown. Water samples were collected from the Tijuana River itself, as well as ocean water from collection sites in Borderfield State Park, Imperial Beach, Silver Strand, along with background measurements at the SIO Pier, about 25 miles to the north. And we collected aerosol filter samples as well at each of these four sites along the coast. With these samples in hand, we performed a protocol developed at Scripps for the metabolomic analysis of complex organic mixtures in marine matrices. Over the course of this study, we collected almost 200 water samples as well as over 100 aerosol samples. We then perform solid phase extraction using PPL resin to concentrate our organic matter for water and aerosol samples, as well as for external standards. And of these standards that we tested, we we're able to achieve limits of detection down to around 10 to 100 ppq in water and about one picogram per meter cubed in aerosol samples. We ran these samples using a non-targeted liquid chromatography tandem mass spec protocol, which allows us to separate out molecules based on their retention time and then perform tandem mass spectrometry on detected masses to achieve fragmentation mass spectra. 
And this is crucial for compound identification via library spectral matching. In total, this translates to over a thousand LCMS-MS runs, which, as you can expect, generates a wealth of data. So to process it, we use existing molecular networking tools, which can pick out commonly detected ions with similar retention times, which we call features. In total, we identified just under 10,000 features over the course of the study. And using the Global Natural Products Social Networking or GNPS platform, uh, we matched just under a thousand of our features to standardized mass spectra. And this platform allows for quick processing of the data, streamlined visualization and statistical analysis, as well as source attribution through different compound class tags. And of our thousand compounds, we were able to classify about two thirds of them based on their source. Once we arrive at these molecular uh, classifications, we can begin to identify different pollution sources. For example, one of the largest concerns in the Tijuana River Valley is sewage and wastewater. And so we can use the presence of drugs like methamphetamine, human biomarkers like glycocolic acid, and personal care products like octanoxate to help us track this source. Additionally, we are concerned with the presence of biocides like isoxaben, amazapir, and diazonon, originating from agricultural sources. And lastly, and most relevant to this session, we see molecular markers of plastics, such as bisphenol derivatives like bisphenol trimethylcyclohexane, bisphenol A diglycidyl ether or badge, as well as molecular markers associated with rubbers like dibenzylamine. And from external calibrations, we can calculate the magnitude of these pollutants entering the ocean from the Tijuana River and ambient concentrations in the aerosol phase, which pose an emerging health threat. In the Tijuana River, we derive a daily mass flux based on mass flow rates of the river and measured concentrations in river water. And median fluxes correspond to almost 100 kilograms per day of the toxic UV filter octanoxate, about 500 grams a day of methamphetamine, and about a gram a day of the biocide diazonon and the rubber accelerant dibenzylamine, which is currently our only quantified um, plastic additive standard. This pattern is repeated in the aerosol phase at Imperial Beach, the closest populated city and major recreational center. Here, beachgoers are exposed to nanogram per meter cubed levels of octanoxate, uh, hundreds of picogram per meter cubed levels of methamphetamine, and tens of picograms uh, per cubic meter levels of diazonon and dibenzylamine. So now viewing this data from a kind of top-down categorical perspective at all sampling sites, it becomes clear that levels of these pollutants correspond to proximity to the Tijuana River. Here, we sum up ion intensities from the categories representing plastics, biocides, personal care products, human biomarkers, drugs, as well as natural products to compare to. And I'd like to flag here that this portion of the analysis is semi-quantitative in nature. And so the key differences are between locations not within these individual stacked boxes, since we are comparing relative intensities. In the dissolved organic matter samples labeled DOM, we see the highest levels in the Tijuana River, followed by Imperial Beach and Boulder Field, slightly lower amounts in Silver Strand, followed by the lowest levels at SIO. This observation is repeated in the aerosol phase, with the highest levels observed at Boulderfield and Imperial Beach, followed by Silver Strand and SIO. You can also glean some information from the relative ratios of different categories from site to site and from sample type to sample type. Notably, plastic associated compounds are highest in the Tijuana River and make up only minor constituents of ocean water samples. However, they are present in large amounts in the aerosol phase, especially close to the Tijuana River and Imperial Beach and Boulderfield. 
Motivated by this, let's take a closer look at how these plastic traces evolve temporally, as well as as a function of changing environmental conditions. So to tease out the impact of these pollution events triggered by transboundary flows of the Tijuana River, shown in brown at the bottom of the stack plot, we plot concurrent levels of summed plastic associated compounds as these blue gray bars. Generally levels rose during the high flow conditions during later sampling periods compared to lower flow conditions during the first sampling period. You can also somewhat observe a first flush effect during the last three sampling periods with highest levels in the beginning days due to initial runoff carrying the bulk of the pollutants. Moving on to our other sampling locations with DOM in the middle and aerosol on the top, you can see a general upwards trajectory in the DOM following pollution events showing that the buildup of release from the Tijuana River results in contaminated ocean water nearby. The dominant sites are those closest to the Tijuana River with Boulder Field in red and Imperial Beach in orange. And these trends generally hold for the aerosol samples as well with the notable inclusion of Silver Strand as a constituent of the total plastics attributed signal in the aerosol phase. And this, in particular, may be due to easier and faster transport in the aerosol to get from Imperial Beach to Silver Strand um, versus in the ocean. And so to investigate evidence of ocean to air flux of these plastic constituents, I plot here levels in the aerosol phase on the Y axis versus levels in the DOM samples on the X axis, with each data point being an individual day and location. Now this is a tenuous relationship at, at best, which we expect due to the inherent variability and multiple factors impacting ocean to air transport, as well as competing terrestrial influences in the aerosol phase. One key driver of sea spray aerosol production is wind speed and associated wave height. And so adding a color scale representing average wave height for each day in sight we can begin to see some explanation for the overrepresentation in the aerosol phase in that upper left corner, uh, with most of these enhanced data points occurring on days with large wave heights. A uh, way to more clearly view this relationship is like this, with plotting the pseudo enrichment factor or the ratio of intensity in the aerosol phase over the um, DOM on the y-axis against the average wave height on the x-axis. And we expect this to follow an exponential trend. And there's obviously still some room for variability here. Um, this is primarily due to grouping together different compounds, which may selectively transfer in different amounts, um, as well as competing terrestrial sources for airborne plastic and different types of removal processes by biodegradation and photooxidative processes um, in the ocean and in the atmosphere. And so to finish this story of ocean to air transport of plastic additives, I'm currently pursuing quantification of a broader range of compounds shown on the right. And like many of us this year, I'm crossing my fingers waiting on supply chain delayed standards to arrive. Additionally, uh, we're pl planning more vigorous environmental modeling to constrain our observed data, as well as predict future pollutant levels to construct better risk assessment models for human exposure. And finally, we believe that follow-up experimental studies are warranted by some of the findings during this campaign. And we're really interested in investigating the selective transfer of different pollutants from the ocean to the air, as well as subsequent atmospheric processing by photooxidative pathways. Um, and this type of research is really enabled by new large scale facilities like the Scripps Ocean Atmosphere Research Simulator shown here on the right. With that, I'd like to thank you all. Um, and if you're watching this before the live session, please come prepared with some questions for discussion. I invite you to reach out to me to connect, especially if you'd like to join the Chemists Without Borders Microplastics Working Group. And finally, I'd like to highlight one of my lab mates, Samantha Cruz, who will be giving a poster presentation on Friday on investigating the photooxidative degradation of bisphenol A in the aerosol phase 
using simulated marine aerosol conditions. Thank you.